welcome to the Dogs and Deadlifts Building Better Dogs and People podcast. Join your host, Daniel Rose, as we discuss everything canine and human strength and conditioning. We talk to experts, hear from people in the know, and just talk the latest on strength and conditioning for both people and their pups. We are about building better dogs and people. So welcome back to the Dogs and Deadlifts podcast. Today, we have another fantastic guest on the show. Welcome, Victor Sindin Larsen from uh, Norway, who is the current world champion, European champion, and uh, Norwegian champion in bike drawing. Welcome. Thank you very much. Mate, it's a, it's a great honor and uh, pleasure to have you here. First of all, I will apologize a little bit uh, in regards to my accent. As we spoke about before, I've been to the dentist today and had a, uh, a tooth extracted. And some of my, uh, my Aussie slang may, uh, or my Aussie language may not be on point today, so I do apologize. <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, I can understand you. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden uh, this afternoon, yeah, a slight, uh, a slight pain in the tooth and uh, had to rush to the dentist. So, uh, But all good now, all good, and I'm really, really excited to have you here. I know that um, a lot of my guests have been asking about when our chat is uh, coming up. So, yeah, like I said, I really, really thank you very much for uh, being on the, on the podcast. Thank Mate. you. So um, I suppose let's just jump in and get started, if that's okay. I know that it's uh, it's probably uh, super cold outside, and you've probably already been out with the dogs this morning, potentially. But uh, can you tell a little little bit about yourself before we jump into the nitty gritties? Uh, how you got started? Obviously, you're quite a high level athlete in the harness dog world. So yeah, can you give us a little bit about your history? Yeah, I'm uh, 39 years old. I'm living here in Oslo, Norway, and all my life is uh, now about the mushing, I would say. Uh, so uh, we live here very close to the city center. Uh, with Now we have six dogs at home. But uh, I started mushing back in, we got our first dog in 2005. And uh, before that, neither me or my wife had had any dogs before. So, uh, so that's when it all started. And uh, yeah, now we're here. Yeah, and twenty uh, years later, with the yes, can I ask, dogs? Can I ask um, what that first dog was? Yeah, it was uh, was a kind of a, a coincidence, I would say. <laughs> or we, um, yeah, when uh, we were studying, we we moved together, me and my wife, and uh, then I wanted to go to to Germany for studying. Then my wife really would like a dog, and uh, and we thought that uh, a GSP would be good for us. Yeah. would be a funny dog that you could use for everything. Yep. So uh, just by coincidence, we found the one puppy on the internet for sale and it turned out to be from one of the best sled dog racers in Norway or even in the world. And uh, so we were really lucky. Yep. It was a pure GSP. And um, when this dog was like two years old, then uh, the breeder was motivating us for, for joining races and, uh, and test how it was running. And... It was a really good runner, so it was plenty of fun, and, <laughs> and we needed one more dog, and yeah. since then, we have got many more dogs. <laughs> Can I ask, were you a, an, an athlete yourself, like uh, growing up, but also, you know, high school and school as a young man, were you uh, like a, a, an athlete? Yeah, most of my time was uh, for sport, but um, like sailing was my key sport that I was trying to be and uh, that I spent most of my time with. So I tried to be, uh, yeah, that was uh, my main sport, I would say. But yeah. uh, when I started studying, then I decided to put it away. It mm -hmm. then was either be a professional sailor or start to studying. So, uh, <laughs> so I decided to study. But uh, And at that time, we started a little bit... Uh, with biking, a little bit with skiing, but uh, not uh, at the professional level at all. Just mm. starting back then. And, but when we got this dog that was a really good run, a good runner and fast dog, it was mm -hmm. motivating to yeah. to start more cycling and more skiing to yeah. be able to help him. And obviously, there's a lot of a lot of uh, time that's happened between, say, when you got started and and now being you know being world champion. <laughs> you know. Uh, there's a lot. We obviously won't be able to go into the, you know, to everything, but uh, that first dog, what was that first dog's name? This first dog's name was uh, Bustle. Mm -hmm. So he was a pure GSP and, and a really good runner. And uh, yeah, back then we only had one dog. So we had to like, it was a competition who was going to, to race with him, but yeah. 
we were really lucky that we joined the club with a high activity level and a lot of other mushers. So we were very lucky being able to borrow different dogs. And uh, so um, yeah. so most of the time we had one dog each. And uh, this uh, sister of Basu, she was a very small and super fast uh, GSP. So, um, so then we had two good dogs, both of us. So that was a real, we got like a flying star into the sport, I would say. And uh, it was a very good uh, environment, this club, a lot of old mushers with a lot of competence. So um, we were able to follow them and we learned a lot in the beginning. So uh, it was a funny start. Yeah, fantastic. And you mentioned that you live in the city or not far from the city there. Is it far for you to get out to, to training uh, in the forests or the fields? No, it's uh, so we live here. Yeah, we live just six kilometers from the city center, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's really crowded around here. But uh, but I would also say that it's the perfect place for a musher to live because mm -hmm. uh, in Oslo we have this uh, city border. So just five minutes away from here, the forest starts. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just go five minutes with car and from there you can go out in the forest forever. So it's, uh, it's a very good place. And here we have a lot of roads. In the winter we have ski trails all over that's prepared every day. And we have this um, artificial snow areas. So mm -hmm. between the seasons, it's always some places you can find snow. Mm -hmm. and. It's no sheep, for example, that's uh, going around like it's most of the places in Norway. Yeah. And it's a good logistic for going to work, etc. So I think the everyday life is very efficient. So it's perfect in that place. The only disadvantage is that the dogs have to live inside, of course. So now we have seven dogs and I think that's <laughs> on the limit of what's, uh, we cannot have more dogs than that. <laughs> So yeah. that's one thing. And of course, it's a lot of people around. So um, my everyday training with the dogs, I try to do it early in the morning before mm -hmm. it goes really crowded into the forests and, uh, and yeah. the ski tracks, etc. cetera. So, yeah. um, and, and living in Norway, you don't, how many hours of daylight would you, uh, you know, <laughs> would you get <laughs> most of the time it's not <laughs> dark? Yeah. Now in the winter, it's dark. Um, a big time of the day but then when it comes to the summer it's the opposite then mm -hmm. it's most days are bright so uh, or it's uh, daylight almost the whole day mm -hmm. 24 hours so um so it's a big variation yeah but i mean uh, it's yeah now it's dark all mm -hmm. of the every time i'm training with the dogs it's dark outside yeah but that's um, okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah so once, you know, obviously you mentioned a minute ago that, uh, you know, that first dog was a, you know, pure GSP that got you started. Can you give us a little bit of a, a journey on how one dog became seven dogs? Obviously there's, there's a number of years in between, but, um, you know, uh, and uh, what dogs do you have currently as well? Yeah. So we had this one dog and then uh, two years later, we got our second dog. And uh, then every second year we had like a new dog. So, yeah. uh, but back then we lived in a small apartment and, uh, it was, um, and our life was not around having dogs. Like, mm -hmm. so, um, so one and two dogs felt like a lot, but, uh, when we got the third dog, then, uh, we had to move out and find the, uh, find the house. And, uh, and back then we had most GSPs and my strategy was like to be competing on a on a good level in both nordic mm -hmm. and in um, and dryland mm -hmm. like even though dryland is what's like my heart closest i'm I, I like to bike more than i like to ski but we tried to compete in both ways like both winter and summer but and it was good in the beginning it was like in our first year the two first dogs was really good and we won the world championship already in 2009 mm -hmm. when we had just been competing for two years. But then I think the international level went a little bit higher. <laughs> it was so many fast dogs around. And I remember back in the European championship, I think it was in 2017 in England, mm -hmm. I had a really fast GSP, but in this competition, we were like, 30 seconds behind every day 
So then I said, just this is enough. It's uh, we cannot be good in both winter and summer. Mm -hmm. So uh, then we decided to go for only gracers, uh, breed for pure speed, and just focus on on the dry land competitions. So uh, we had already been breeding. Uh, together with uh, Beatrice Scatti, which we cooperate with. And, uh, and she has this uh, beautiful uh, grace there called Saga. And uh, she gave us two, two puppies, both Sagan and Siri. And then um, the strategy was like to just go for the bike drawing. But this was two amazing dogs. And it turned out that uh, Sagan could also do the 15 kilometers. Okay. In the winter time, so um, so <laughs> now we still compete both winter and summer, but uh, we'll see for how long. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan is still if the the level is uh, getting too high, we will drop out the winter and just focus on the bike touring. But yeah. until now, both things works. Uh, yeah, because I, I know that uh, in a previous podcast, you know, you talk about um, the difference now in the dogs, and you you know, to quote yourself, you you mentioned you know they're super dogs now. You know, can you explain what you mean by that or the difference in your you know in your own words? Yeah, it's. Um, of course, every dog is individual, but in mm -hmm. theory, the, the pure GSPs, they are a little bit slower, mm -hmm. but a little bit stronger as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so in my opinion, they work better on the Nordic part where you run a little bit longer. Often you use the Pulka, it's heavier condition, it's lower average speed compared to the GSPs that of course have more Greyhound, they have different muscles. Mm -hmm. They run more efficient on high speed, mm -hmm. but if it's uh, slow conditions and they are not that efficient, then of course they don't manage to run the same long distances, especially in the winter when we do 15 kilometers and you have the Pulka, for example, mm -hmm. they are not that efficient. Um, they don't have the same stamina, but Siri and Sagan, or especially Sagan, he was uh, fast and had the, the stamina as well to, to manage the 15 kilometers. So, uh, yeah. so then it was fun to race him as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you also mentioned, I mean, like I said, I'll, I'll just go off a couple of, you know, previous podcasts, but the way that you uh, trained previously with the dogs was, uh, you know, a potentially a, a light, medium and heavy type day. Can we talk about, you know, what you're doing now in regards to uh, training? Yeah. I think our training, since we live in Norway, the training varies a lot during the year mm -hmm. because we have different season. And, but in theory, yeah, now in the Corona time, we are testing out a little bit new way of training. And I listen to some running podcasts and uh, I think the dog training is very much related to runners. Like, obviously they do the same, but... Mm -hmm. um, so I got some new inspiration for, um, from some uh, running podcasts. And running is really popular here in Norway now. They have some really good uh, mid-distance runners. And they do a more linear way of uh, having the weeks. So now this year I'm testing out <laughs> a new strategy. Yeah. With a more linear way of uh, training. Mm -hmm. But even though we don't yet testing we are testing out not the same late light medium hard i mm -hmm. think the theory in training is still the same so now we try to follow more a steady program for three yeah, four or five weeks before we have a, a lighter week but in general it's like every second day training and but try to add a, a little bit more so let's say an average of four, four times a week, I think, and a little bit of uh, free running in the garden and a little bit core training. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, it's more important, like how you build up the trainings and what you do between and how, how every training is, uh, how you, how you do every exercise kind of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's yeah. maybe more important. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned earlier that as well that, you know, you're training different too there now with COVID, you know, you're jumping on uh, the indoor bike and, and on Zwift. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, I try to train a lot. That's uh, kind of uh, when you do, do bike touring and ski touring, you have to train a lot yourself. And mm -hmm. uh, now with the home office, 
have made my day so much easier and I have improved a lot. So, um, yeah, I tried to train the dogs in the morning mm -hmm. and I don't see this as a training myself, even though you have to bike or ski a little bit, but it doesn't give you much in kind of relative effort. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, so I have to train myself in the evenings mm -hmm. and I try to follow a steady program on the and now uh, with the, it's really cold weather has uh, uh, back in history when I have to go to work and it's cold it's kind of been hard to train this um, this time of year but now I've started with the Swift as you said and uh, yeah, made life so much easier it's uh, so now it's uh, ski training and uh, some indoor cycling most of the time yeah yeah do you train a large obviously you mentioned skiing but you know a big portion of your training is on the bike yeah i tried to follow uh, kind of a, a program where i have mondays most of the time off mm -hmm. tuesday is a light training and then i have intervals or bike competitions and wednesdays and thursdays and then i have um, longer trainings with maybe some intervals on saturdays and some days so that's the plan but uh, but yeah. then i try to vary between the skiing and biking so mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it depends a little bit i'm flexible depending yeah. on the weather or what is going on on and uh, but i try to have the same schedule every week but if it's bike or skiing now in the winter that doesn't matter but but in the summer it's only bikes and, yep. uh, in the summer, do you get on the like the road bike, or do you uh, mountain bike primarily uh, in the summer? Yeah, most of the training is on the on the road bike. Okay, I would say maybe 80, 90 percent is on the road, but mm -hmm. but all my competitions are on the mountain bike, and I try to have some mountain bike intervals as well. But road bike is so much easier. Not much cleaning. It's mm -hmm. very uh, <laughs> and uh, and. <laughs> I'm not afraid of breaking the bike. I'm always afraid of uh, crashing and uh, breaking my bike when I do mountain biking. So I prefer to have the road bike. And obviously, uh, uh, you know, you can you know can get out and do lots lots of kilometers as well. You know, quite easily building a base, and then when you when you need to do hills or uh, you know the intervals, you can get out there as well. Is that correct? Yeah, but most of my training is is intervals. It's so okay. busy days and. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm out with the dogs uh, mm -hmm. like almost every day. So I look at this as kind of my low intensity training. Mm -hmm. And then when I train only myself without the dogs, then it's mainly intervals. So okay. yeah. four times a week intervals. Yeah. So do you vary those? Do you say time and, and, or, and or distance for yourself? Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I vary them a lot, but mm -hmm. it's more during what time of year it is. Mm -hmm. Far away from competitions, I have long intervals, mm -hmm. and the closer we get to the competitions, we we put the time down. So shorter intervals, yeah. closer to competition, just to build up some speed and power. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about um, bikes for a moment. You know, what bikes are you, you know have you currently got, and what are you currently riding, brand wise? Love to hear about that. Yeah. So we're very lucky. We've been sponsored by Cube and. They have some really good bikes, and uh, but um, both of us are riding on a, on a full suspension. Uh, maybe it would be efficient to have one of each, one hardtail on full suspension. But say I only can afford like one bike, yeah, I prefer to have a full suspension. I think that's more, especially for the cross country races, it's more efficient. But also for the bike touring, I think yeah, full suspension in yeah maybe. Let's say six out of 10 races, a full mm -hmm. suspension is better. And mm -hmm. for the minding four, it doesn't matter if you have full suspension or, or a hardtail normally. Mm -hmm. So, um, so because I only have one bike for a competition, I'm here to have a full suspension. And um, yeah, it's when, the, when the speed is high, mm -hmm. it's so nice to, to sit <laughs> on, uh, on a full suspension. And, the modern full suspension bikes, they are so efficient and so light and, uh, yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Beautiful to ride. <laughs> they are. <laughs> yeah. What about for the dogs, you know, in regards to uh, harness equipment, I know that, uh, 
you know, you're a nonstop athlete as well. So do you have a preferred uh, harness that you'd like your dogs to run in? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with the, with the nonstop harnesses, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very, it's so individual from mm -hmm. dog to dog. And uh, so it's, yeah, you just have to test and try. Mm -hmm. Some run really good in the free motion and some are better in the, in the nonsen harness. And, uh, and I also try to variate as much. Mm -hmm. Like each dog we, we change for training. So I think variation is also a very important element into it. Mm -hmm. Even though they have a preferred harness and some run better in the free motion, for example, we, we try to switch all the time. So I think that's important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Interesting. At the moment, obviously, the world is a bit a bit crazy, and uh, we're not sure, quite sure about events and things like that for twenty twenty one. But what are your, I suppose, goals at this point in time, or is there any, you know, a race coming up? I'd love to hear about that if everything goes to plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, in now in Norway. Of course, the the world championship on snow is cancelled. So this year, the it's the Norwegian championships. That is our main goals, but now they are canceled or at least postponed. Uh, so um, we will most likely, if there are any championships in Norway, they will be later this winter. So it's a little bit hard. And this year it's also a Norwegian championship in four dog class. So mm -hmm. we are preparing for that, but yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. it's hard to prepare with so many dogs but yeah. then it's the world championship uh, draw mm -hmm. world championship next year that will be yeah our next big thing yeah for sure and a perfect example we've just had a state here in australia close its borders for four days because they've had you know some covid outbreaks so if you're planning to go to that particular state over the weekend um unfortunately the wall's up and you can't come you know so things can change it's it's obviously we're here on a for me it's friday you know and that we don't know what's happening so it's obviously it's very tricky and you know to plan but uh so 2022 will be the the big one for you if everything goes well then yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's nothing <laughs> nothing really big before yeah uh no it's in the fall, mm -hmm. this fall. Yeah. So the fall of 2021 okay. will be the next world championship, trial and world championship. Yes. Sorry. Yes. But, but that's very soon. So <laughs> that's right. I don't know if it's, I don't know if, if it's possible. <laughs> that's right. So there's so many unknowns out there. It is. So it's, uh, it's uh, I think it's a little bit hard because it is, uh, yeah, to train the dogs, it's, uh, yeah. it, it requires quite a lot. And when you don't know if it's anything coming up, then yeah, I can feel it's, uh, I think it's a little bit hard to motivate for when you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Look, uh, and I think, uh, you know, many people around the world are in, in a uh, very similar situation. It's very frustrating, but all we can do is continue on the path and have those goals and uh, surround ourselves with positive people and that, um, you know, continue to push through to those goals, you know, you know, it's definitely hard for sure. So I also wanted to just ask, you know, you're in regards to, uh, you know, getting to the world championships uh, and also having a number of dogs that are, that were, you know, injury free and uh, all very good in, in uh, regards to their health. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, I suppose, that and also your wife coming on board and assisting with um, the management of the dog's health? Yeah, I think um, yeah, my wife, she's a physiotherapist for, mm -hmm. for humans and mm -hmm. she took one year off to educate herself for dog physiotherapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has been like a big change in our, uh, in our sled dog, um, what do you call it? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Made a big difference for us. Mm -hmm. Because most of the dogs are very good runners, but um, but to keep them really, I call it free of injuries. But mm -hmm. what I really mean is like, I think now they don't run with kind of the brakes on. Mm -hmm. The way of make sure that they are always 100%, it's uh, been such a big difference. Um, and uh, yeah, she spends a lot of time always observing them mm -hmm. how they walk what they do and and a lot of time just touching them feeling we're spending almost every evening we go over each dog 
and it just made such a big difference and mm -hmm. especially after we're having most of our dogs are really really good and um, and now when uh, they are not running with their brakes on <laughs> yeah and yeah. keeping them injury free it's uh, is a really important element for us and uh, as i said earlier when we got cd and sagan the main thing was just to make sure that they come to the starting line without any anything uh, holding them back mm -hmm. and uh, so therefore we tried to train maybe a little bit more um, careful than others maybe mm -hmm. everything is just it's better to to be yeah careful mm -hmm. instead of um, pushing and uh, just make sure that they come to the start without any mm -hmm. anything holding them back yeah yeah and does that also apply for yourself as well <laughs> you know in um, regards mm. to to uh, massage and recovery no <laughs> not in that term <laughs> she spent all her energy on the dog so just having obviously having your wife there to uh observe the dogs to to treat them to massage them um to make sure that they get good recovery they can uh potentially uh, as you mentioned go to the start line without restriction and potentially give fantastic effort on the race day yeah yeah what i was meaning was that the to have continuity in the training it's mm -hmm. really important so if you have continuity you do the job every day you don't have to push so hard each time so our training is we go at slow speed mm -hmm. we don't push for very long distances but to be able to do the same over and over and over again Mm -hmm. will like bring you better results than mm -hmm. to push super hard yeah. quite yeah. often it's yeah. better to go a little bit slower so each training it's not super hard mm -hmm. but when you do it again and again and again you can do it more often and yeah. i think that will bring better results so mm -hmm. yeah so, so um very consistent with your trainings yeah and the, consistent yeah and don't train too hard so mm -hmm. that more keep in mind what you're going to train the day after mm -hmm. like have have the next day training in the back of your mind when you do your training both for the dogs and and for us it's um yeah so in that terms i think we do mm -hmm. have this theory kind of uh, behind in both the dog training and the human training mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's yeah. important Yep. Do you have um, any particular uh, theories around nu nutrition for for yourself or the or the dogs as well? Yeah, yeah. I think nutrition is very important. Of course, mm -hmm. it's a little bit different between us and the dogs. But, <laughs> That's uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, it's both for biking and for uh, when you race with dogs, it's important to have a a low weight. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I try. <laughs> I do my best to keep it low. <laughs> You're only a small man anyway. What what do you weigh? <laughs> yeah, now it's 62 kilos. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's a little bit more. It was down on 60 some years ago, but yeah. uh, then yeah. it wasn't much power. <laughs> so, uh, But yeah, the last uh, two years I've been on the program trying to build up power, mm -hmm. leg power. So we had the high focus on that. But mm -hmm. now with COVID, the fitness centers closed. So um uh, Mm -hmm. Now I'm trying a new theory to mm -hmm. go more more on swift and intervals. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, we'll yep. see if it's any difference. But yeah, yep. yeah weight is low. <laughs> sure. What about um? Are you into sort of in regards to nutrition for the dogs? Do you feed uh, uh like a dry or a kibble or or a, a raw? Do you have uh, your own personal preference on that? Yeah, we have. It's a difficult topic to talk well, about. I think it's a lot of opinions out there. But mm, that's right. But and also we are sponsored by royal canine mm -hmm. so um yeah but we used the royal canine before we got sponsored and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course after they started to sponsor us we, we continue and mm -hmm. i'm super happy with uh with what they deliver they have mm -hmm. something for each of the dogs and uh, they um but when we started using royal canine my theory was that such a big company with a, with a lot of science behind what they do a lot of knowledge i think that's mm -hmm. i trust that more than 
small companies mm -hmm. that put uh, something together and uh, and also we only use kibbles is mm -hmm. that what you call it yes yes kibbles. yeah it's um because yeah i think the kibbles that they produce works really good it, mm -hmm. so it's no need for feeding raw and mm -hmm. when we don't and to me, it's um, the kind of the logistic around raw feeding is yeah. If I can avoid mm. using it, it's simpler, more simple to to just give them uh, the kibbles and uh, sure. yeah. and I also don't know if yeah, since our dogs live inside, yeah, yeah I don't know how healthy it is to have raw food mm. all over. If it's possible to feed raw without bringing all this into the the environment that you live in. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just happy that I can yeah. avoid feeding raw mm -hmm. and the dogs still run very well. That's exactly right. And, and like you said, there's many opinions on uh, that and uh, we won't get into those, you know, <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, I just thought I would ask and, you know, and if your dogs are doing well on it, you know, and that's it, obviously know what's best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. that's, I think, the tea. Mm -hmm. and they run very well and mm -hmm. seems healthy and happy without yeah. raw food. So, yeah. uh, so then I'm happy that I yeah. don't have to give them. But of course, they yeah. love raw food. So, um, <laughs> so sometimes it's nice to give them just to see yeah, how sure. good they, they think it tastes. Oh, but, um, 100%. Yeah. Look, we've obviously covered on quite a little bit t tonight. And I, pre I, look, look, I really appreciate your time. Obviously, yeah, as you mentioned before, the season's a little bit all over the place. You know, hard to get into, you know, a regular routine for, for races, et cetera. But is there anything that, um, you know, if, if someone was starting out brand new to the sport, obviously, uh, you know, what advice, maybe three tips of advice, what would you, you feel like you, you could give them? Three tips, if you're mm -hmm. new, mm -hmm. would be to uh, uh, try to gain knowledge, mm -hmm. meet the other mushers, 